Welcome to Digital Technologies. My name is Dr. Jason Zagami, and I'll be guiding you in prepare, preparation for you to become teachers of digital technologies, one of the Australian curriculum subjects and is taught in all Australian states. Um, and the focus of this course is on years seven to 10 or high school, junior high school. Now this presentation will take you through the first in our exploration topics, the curriculum. And we'll then have a tutorial, online tutorial, where you'll participate with your webcam and microphone, and we'll discuss and get to know each other a bit more, unpack the curriculum, and go through in much more detail some of the things that I'll be presenting in this short presentation. So the first thing we need to explore is what the curriculum is. Now, the Australian curriculum has only been around for less than a decade. Um, it has been fully implemented in Queensland for all of the subjects, and we tend to follow the curriculum quite closely. Other states follow it at, to, to differing degrees, um, but you'll find that you'll be able to teach digital technologies in any state in Australia without any difficulties. Overseas, many other countries also have similar curriculum and we'll be exploring some of those uh, during our tutorials. And you'll also be able to teach in many of those um, jurisdictions. So what is curriculum? Curriculum is essentially what has been decided from the body of knowledge of, in our case, digital technologies, students should learn. And we break that down into age groups and the Australian curriculum has two year bands. And we then define what students should know by each of these bands. So the curriculum is simply the decisions that have been made on what students should be learning during their time in school at various time stages. Now the digital technologies curriculum is quite young. Um, that said, uh, computer education has been occurring in Australian schools since the 80s. Um, various early stages were using punch cards and then we had floppy disks and PCs and so forth. And many of you probably have been through schooling where you had some computer education of some sort. Now, in the very early days, it was mostly taught through mathematics course it was focused around programming. Why? At that point in the development of computers, in order to do anything functional with them, you had to essentially program them yourselves. There weren't very many applications or pre-made software that you could simply use. Through the 90s and into the turn of the century, we tended to focus on the teaching of applications particularly business applications, Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint. And then into the 2010s, the internet came along and we started teaching about um, creating websites. Um, and that then moved a little bit further into, into using some um, applications, particularly the apps that came on tablet devices, um, smartphones and tablets that had another revolution in terms of the use of applications in education. But we strayed a long way from the foundations of computer education and computer science, which was fundamentally about understanding computers and being able to create with them, creating applications, creating websites, um, creating new software, programming robots to do things. So the digital technologies curriculum has very much been refocused on that. So away from the teaching of applications, and focused on the creation of new um, tools and techniques to solve problems. Now, why this big focus on digital technologies? Well, um, throughout the world, uh, including nationally, but more specifically locally in Queensland, there was a big focus on preparing students for the future of work. Um, society was changing dramatically. We've got a lot of focus on the use of technology now, and we need to make sure our students are prepared for that world, prepared to be able to work 
and learn and socialize in a world that's dominated by technology. Now, regardless of your, your views on whether or not that's a good or bad thing, the fact is it's a reality. And we need to make sure that our students can survive and thrive in that environment. Now, the, um, the Queensland Government commissioned a report on the potential future in Queensland for our students. And it looked pretty grim if you didn't have a background in digital technologies. So the digital technologies um, subject and curriculum was given uh, prominence and quite a lot of support, particularly for the primary years where primary year teachers were seen as having some struggles in preparing to teach this new curriculum. And we now have a strong focus on the teaching of digital technologies in Queensland schools. So is it really affecting every industry? Now, when you come to tutorial, I want you to come along with some ideas of industries that have changed dramatically as a result of digital technologies. Some of you will have experienced that in your own careers, um, but you should all have some anecdotes and examples to be able to provide us to assist in our discussions in the tutorial. I've got a friend that makes giant milking machines and he goes around the world installing these uh, computerized uh, milking machines that involve no human intervention at all. The cows enter the machine completely autonomously, get milked several times a day, wander off. It tests all of their uh, biometric details and makes sure they're healthy, injects them with um, things that they need to and adds them to their food. And it's all a completely automated process. That would have been unthinkable 20, 30 years ago in the farming industry. But farming is dramatically um, changing as a result of technology. Of course, it increases efficiency and product and profit. So any new technology that is available that can provide a competitive advantage is explored. Of course, it's also happening in the mining industry where we're seeing larger and larger computerized um, machines digging up minerals and exporting them off to make money. But also in our everyday activities, at our checkouts, um, increasingly they're becoming self-service with various AI systems keeping track of us and making sure we don't um, abscond with products that we haven't paid for and various other technologies in being included into um, the supply chain to make sure that there's always product on the shelves and that product doesn't expire and all the rest that's involved with um, the retail industries. Fast food has been changing. Australia was a leader in introducing these automated um, checkout systems in fast food chains. They tried introducing them in the United States and there was an uproar um, and they had to withdraw them. But they certainly have been proven quite popular here in Australia. But of course, some industries have embraced and engaged with technology more readily and more successfully than others. Um, the airline industry, not counting, of course, the current pandemic, um, was completely changed as a result of being able to self-book and self-select destinations and accommodation and all the rest that has to go with what was travel agencies. And there's some emerging technologies. Uh, virtual excursions and virtual holidays haven't quite taken off yet, but there are those that are exploring that potential. And of course, we've seen dramatic changes in the automotive and transportation industries, where self-driving vehicles will likely be the norm, if not mandated, within the next decade. So things are changing really dramatically in many, many industries, and there's lots more, and I hope you'll bring a few to our discussion during the tutorial. One area I spend a lot of time working with is robotics and AI, uh, particularly around their uses in education. And we're going to explore a few of those during this course to a small extent. Um, teaching of AI didn't make it into the Australian curriculum. It was a little bit too new. Of course, AI has been around for decades, but it fell out of favour for 
um, during the, the 90s and early 2000s. Um, it only re-emerged in um, the early 20, oh, about five years ago. It re-emerged and has really, really taken off again. And so we're now rushing to reintroduce the teaching of AI back into the curriculum. And there is a curriculum revision undergoing at the moment, the Australian Curriculum, Digital Technologies. And there will be some changes made, not huge changes. What you're prepared for in this course will certainly still be 95% um, accurate. And indeed, I'll be introducing you to some of the drafts as that curriculum change occurs. But robotics and automation are affecting every field, and not just education, but also medicine, um, where personal assistants are being seen as the step before full automation, where we will work with an assistant AI, or assistant robotic device or whatever, but they'll be assisting us in our workplaces rather than replacing us. Now, in many cases, eventually that replacement will probably occur but it won't happen for a while. There'll be that assisted process. And of course, we need to prepare our students for that environment. Um, not just to make sure that they don't get replaced as quickly as they might, but also to become leaders and out in front of that process so that they're always looking for the next niche where humans will continue to provide the dominant support mechanism, whatever that may be. And that's one of the big challenges of teaching of digital technologies. We don't know what the future is going to entail. When I started teaching, there wasn't the internet. Well, there was, but it was very different to how we now see it today. But it's completely changed many aspects of education. Um, we have to prepare our students to be able to cope for similar seismic changes, which will occur into the future. So part of that is preparing them with what are called 21st century skills. Being able to communicate effectively, collaborate effectively, engage with critical thinking, and be creative. And these are seen as core skills that will help them regardless of what occurs into the future. Every couple of years, a employment survey is done as to what are the key skills that employers are looking for. And you'll see from 2015 to 2020, it's changed a little. Problem solving is still number one. Critical thinking is increasing. Creativity has jumped up. Wanting our employer, employees to be creative, to be innovative, to be looking at doing things differently, not just doing what we tell them to do, not just following their scripts or following the automated processes, but actually coming up with better processes on their own. Now, this is a big, big change because we've generally allocated managers and middle managers and a whole lot of um, levels to provide that process. Now we're expecting all employers to do that. So middle managers are in big trouble. Managers are even in trouble. If employers at the lowest level are the ones in control and being able to make those decisions and make those creative processes to improve productivity and everything else involved, that changes things quite dramatically including for education. But we'll talk about a bit more about that during our tutorial. So this is one example of a teacher in Victoria, a primary school teacher, and he decided to teach his students about the digital economy and Bitcoin, and they set up their own Bitcoining mining uh, computer, and the students are learning about um, digital money and digital economy, they mine their own bitcoins and they can use that to purchase things from the tuck shop. Um, so one of the fun things about teaching digital technologies is you get to explore new technologies, things that are out of the ordinary. It also has its own challenge because everything's always changing. Other subjects like mathematics and English can go decades without a change in their curriculum in terms of their content. In digital technologies, it changes almost every year. I've never taught the same content twice in a row in 30, 35 plus years of teaching. So it's nice to have a subject that constantly changes, 
It always keeps you on your toes. You're always developing fresh new ideas and fresh new approaches. And it can be challenging. But it's also a lot of fun, particularly if you like technology. If you don't, then you're probably going to have a little bit of a struggle teaching digital technologies. But if you like exploring new things such as drones and robots and AI and various other technologies as they emerge, then it can keep you engaged and enthused. That said, there has been a problem in the past where teachers of digital technologies, or I should say computer studies, tended to focus on the latest new gadget or, or um, piece of software and teach that. And essentially they were teaching the toys. They find the latest new toy, it was fun and exciting, VR headsets, let's all teach VR headsets. That's not what digital technologies is about. Digital technologies now has a curriculum. It has a set of things that students need to learn. In the past, we could get away with teaching whatever we wanted. And it was often the latest fad. Got students excited. Um, we'd be excited preparing it and learning about it. And it was, it was fun, but it didn't necessarily prepare them at the level and depth that we need them to be creating their own new things. That's the big change. We're no longer teaching students about things, about the latest software, about the latest um, technology. We're preparing students to be able to create their own new technologies. That's the seismic change between what was computer studies and what is now digital technologies. So digital technologies though is still an emerging subject. It's developmental and it's a developmental curriculum. We've never had this before in computer education. We've always had some sort of computer education. It might've happened in year six or year seven or year nine. And you would have no doubt experienced a little bit of computer education yourself. I certainly hope. Um, we've generally always had a subject in years not in 11 and 12, in the senior school, preparing them for pre-tertiary um, computer science courses. But throughout the rest of the curriculum, it was very much hit and miss. And the problem with that was, is that you, could, you didn't have an assumed body of knowledge that you could build upon. In mathematics, if you're teaching year nine mathematics, you know pretty much what students should have learnt in year eight and year seven. Doesn't necessarily mean they learnt it, but they should have learnt it. So you can build upon that. And most mature subjects like mathematics or geography or history or science have that continuum from the earliest years of school all the way through where students build upon what they understand about that domain of knowledge. We now have that in digital technologies. From the very first years, the foundation years in schooling, all the way through to year eight, it's now compulsory for students to study digital technologies. So in high school, they'll study it in years seven and eight. Then they'll have an optional study in years nine and 10. And then the Australian curriculum finishes and they'll have the option to do a senior subject in years 11 and 12. So that can be up to 14 years of computer education. And that's fantastic, but it also offers a really big challenge. In the past, we tended to teach really, really superficial stuff. Um, the whole thing about teaching spreadsheets year after year after year, all the options in spreadsheets. Um, and then it was all the options in creating a web page. That you can't do for 14 years. Um, it was destroying the subject when it was done for two or three years in a row. So we now have to go into much more depth. Students coming into high school will already know a programming language, at least one. They will already know how to create web pages. They will already know how to utilize data. We will then build upon that as the curriculum will dictate, as we'll see when we explore the curriculum in more depth and go to much higher levels. Eventually, we'll be going far beyond what students will be doing in the first years of university. Not quite yet, but we're already showing now that students will be doing some really quite complex um, concepts in computer science education as they progress through. 
Now, don't be too worried about that. It's still relatively simple stuff from an adult's perspective. Um, yes, you'll need to know a programming language. Yes, you'll need to know a, a query language, a structured query language, such as SQL for database analysis and so forth. You'll need to be able to teach about web pages and web page design and things of that nature. But there are resources to assist you and there are textbooks and lots of support available to help prepare you. But it is assumed that you've got a reasonably good background in technologies, in digital technologies, and that you'll be able to pick up what you don't know. Now, in this course, we won't be teaching you those skills. Um, unfortunately, the, the curriculum courses assume prior knowledge. Um, and for those involved in the master's program, you'll get that in your um, subject specific courses. So what do we teach? First thing we need to understand is that there is a progression over bands. We break down what is to be taught into age bands. Um, foundation to year two, year three to year four, for this course in Pacific, seven and eight and nine and 10. So we have two bands and we define what students will learn over those two bands. Now that's likely going to change in the revisions to the Australian curriculum where we'll break things down into individual years, but that may not happen for a few years yet. The other thing to understand is we're still in transition. A lot of teachers and a lot of schools are still finding their way with how to teach digital technologies. Lots of teachers are not prepared to be able to teach digital technologies. They've had to self teach themselves and the expectations are now much, much higher than they have been in the past. The Coding Counts initiative that I talked about at the start, the Queensland initiative, was about providing funding to schools to be able to employ specialists to be able to teach digital technologies. Of course, we discovered that we just didn't have a workforce that was capable of teaching digital technologies at scale. So the government put in place a stopgap measure to employ um, specialists for a few years and that's still happening, but will be running out fairly soon in terms of the funding. And at that stage, teachers should have had that time to have prepared themselves to be able to teach digital technologies. Now in high schools, a little bit different where we have specialist teachers as the norm, um, but not always. In seven and eight, we often bring in teachers from many areas to teach various subjects. Um, and there will be teachers teaching digital technologies that won't have much experience with programming and databases and things of that nature. Good for you, because there's lots of job opportunities. Um, not so good though, if you go into a school where they're struggling and don't have a well-established uh, program for students to learn digital technologies. Uh, the curriculum though does provide the overarching framework and guidance and expectations of what should be taught. And schools have to find ways of coming up to speed and meeting the requirements of the curriculum. In theory, doesn't always happen, um, but hopefully eventually it will. And when you go out onto your practicums, you'll be hopefully placed with a teacher that is engaged effectively with digital technologies. And we'll show you how that particular school that you're exploring has embraced the process of engaging with digital technologies. That leads us into variety. There's lots of different ways of approaching teaching digital technologies. Um, throughout Australia, different states have adopted different approaches. In New South Wales, for example, they're teaching it combined with designer technology. Um, other states are doing things differently. Victoria is teaching it with ICT. Uh, we'll talk about ICT in a second. Um, in Queensland, we tend to teach it straight as the Australian curriculum was designed and intended as a standalone subject, but not all schools are doing that. Um, some are doing it in conjunction with design and technology, particularly in primary, but some seven and eight schools are doing the same. Um, some are doing it as a STEM subject where they combine it with mathematics and science. Um, so there's various approaches that are being taken, which is a good thing. It provides opportunities to explore what might be possible and to try to find the best approach for teaching digital technologies. So digital technologies involves a range of 
capabilities for you as a teacher. First is you need to have content knowledge. You need to have knowledge of what is in the curriculum and um, that you understand what is in the curriculum, the content that's in the curriculum. So part of the curriculum is teaching a programming language. So you need to know a programming language. Part of it is around databases, uh, formatting data. You need to know how to format data. There's lots of things that the curriculum will define for students to learn, but also means that the teachers need to learn it. Now, it doesn't mean you need to learn it all at once. Um, many teachers are learning things just before they teach them. That's okay in the first couple of runs through. Um, there'll always be new things in the curriculum that you're not 100% familiar with, and you'll have to do some preparation and some prior learning. But what you can't do is just rely upon the students learning it without you having an understanding. You're there to support their learning, and you can't do that effectively unless you know it yourself. So while you can get away with it for a little bit and for a little while, you can't get away for it forever and in totality. And part of that is also pedagogy. Pedagogy are approaches to teaching. And there are certain pedagogies, approaches to teaching digital technologies that are specialized to teaching digital technologies. Uh, probably the, the two key ones that we're going to be exploring in this course are direct instruction, which is quite common, um, where a teacher gets up and teaches students something explicitly. But particularly in digital technologies, we make use of different approaches to, to direct instruction, particularly using self-paced online tutorials. Um, many of you would have done a programming tutorial where you do it online, you solve problems, it tells you whether or not the code is correct and guides you through the learning process. That's an example of direct instruction. Doesn't involve a teacher, not explicitly, um, but essentially the computer is replacing the teacher for that process. Other forms of direct instruction might be workbooks and guidebooks that students work through. But another approach that we'll touch on in this course, um, and we'll discuss in particular in our tutorials, is project-based learning. Now, there are various approaches to project-based learning and, it's, um, and other similar approaches, such as inquiry-based learning and um, problem-based learning. Inquiry-based learning you'll find in the sciences. Uh, Problem-based learning you'll find in mathematics, but project-based learning is really particular to digital technologies, where students take a real-world problem and attempt to solve that problem using technologies. And we'll discuss that in more detail later in the course. And finally, there's also technologies. There's a range of technologies you need to be familiar with. It might be a robotics, <coughs> oh, excuse me, a robotics kit. It might be a particular piece of software, say Adobe Photoshop. Um, there's a range of technologies that support the learning and the teaching of any subject area. And in digital technologies, we have quite a range and we'll be exploring that range during this course. So those three areas form our knowledge areas. And the idea is that we need to have a good balance of all three and that gives us an intersection called the TPAC, where we have good content knowledge coupled with good uses of technology and a good pedagogy that supports both of those, provides the optimal learning environment for our students. So what is the content that we're going to be learning or you're going to be teaching and your students will be learning? We group all of this content into what's called scope and sequences. Scope is um, the depth and the range of what we're teaching, and the sequence is the order in which we teach it. And we're going to be looking at a range of these scopes and sequences of schools that have adopted digital technologies and worked out how they're going to teach it. The curriculum itself is broken into a range of areas. Firstly, two subjects, design and technologies and digital technologies. This course will only be focusing on digital technologies. Both subjects though, however, have as their focus, creating solutions, creating real world solutions to problems. 
Unlike science, which is mostly about investigation and understanding the natural world, digital technologies is much more focused around an engineering perspective, taking a problem and finding a solution to that problem. And in digital technologies, we utilize digital technologies tools to achieve that solution. There are a range of thinking skills that are developed as part of that process. And these are specific to digital technologies. We'll also have a bit of overlap with design technology, but um, the first is design thinking. Um, this is thinking as a designer and going through a design process in order to achieve that solution. We have systems thinking, which is better understanding a complex system to better understand the problem involved and finding the elements of that system that can be amenable to change in order to affect a more effect effective solution. Computational thinking is a range of techniques and processes related to computer science that can support problem solving. Strategic thinking primarily involves project management, but can also involve other business management um, approaches to thinking about problems, uh, particularly entrepreneurship. And futures thinking, which is exploring uh, futures studies techniques, in particular, identifying a preferred future, what we want to see the world like, and how our solution that we develop using digital technologies can help achieve that world. So they're the higher order thinking skills that are the focus of digital technologies. Now you won't find these explicitly in the learning outcomes of the curriculum, but you will find them in the aim and in the focus aspect of the curriculum. So this is really what we want students to be learning, how to develop and use these thinking skills. There's a whole lot of other skills and knowledge that we're going to develop in students to be able to enable them to do these things. But this is the overall aim of the digital technology subject. So within the subject itself, though, we also have our knowledge and understanding, the facts and specific knowledge that students can um, repeat in terms of their understanding of various concepts. And that's broken into two main areas, digital systems, which is the hardware, the software, the various bits of a computer system, and the representation of data. So pretty much as I just said. <laughs> and then we also have processes and production skills. Now these are broken into two areas. One is collecting, managing, and analyzing data. Um, we'll do a fair bit of work with data um, in digital technologies, as opposed to we also to use programming languages and stuff like that, but we also have as another main focus, uh, the use of data. And then we have a process where we create digital solutions by going through a series of stages. Firstly, investigating and defining a problem, generating and designing possible solutions to that problem, producing and implementing at least one of those solutions, testing and evaluating that solution, and throughout the whole process, collaborating and managing the process of doing so. The three main themes within digital technologies are coding and programming, robotics and automation, and data and information. We also have something called the ICT general capabilities. As part of the Australian curriculum, there's a range of general capabilities. These are things that are taught across all subjects. So all subjects are responsible for teaching numeracy and literacy and the ICT general capability, as well as a few others. Now the ICT general capability is really about assigning responsibility for the teaching of how to use digital technologies. So how to use digital technologies is not the sole responsibility of the digital technology subject. That's quite a shift from how things used to be with computer studies, where other subjects relied upon digital technologies to teach students how to use word processes and spreadsheets and web page design and things of that nature. That's now the responsibility of all subjects. So if a mathematics teacher wants to use a spreadsheet, they teach them how to use spreadsheets. 
if an English teacher wants them to use word processor, they teach them how to use the word processor and so forth. That said, in digital technologies, we obviously have a, a big focus on using a range of digital technologies and we do utilize them far more than other subjects. But the ICT general capabilities sits outside of digital technologies, unless you're teaching in Victoria, in which can then where they're embedded. Um, but the key definition or distinction between digital technologies and the ICT general capabilities is that the ICT general capabilities are learning how to use digital technologies, how to use a data logger, how to use a robot. Digital technologies is about how to create with those technologies, how to use a robot to create a solution to rescuing someone from a burning building, how to use a or use some uh, web design software to create a solution to disseminating information about a party and making sure that everyone can log in, um, sign up for coming to the party, what gifts they're going to bring, what, what they're going to wear so that no two people wear the same clothes to the party and get embarrassed and things of that nature. Creating solutions to problems using digital technologies. The other key general capability that we have in digital technologies is critical and creative thinking where across the curriculum, across all subjects, students need to be taught how to be critical and creative thinkers. And we have opportunities within digital technologies to support that process in particular, particularly through project-based learning. I've talked a little bit about integration, where digital technologies can be taught with designer technologies, particularly in the younger years. And it can also sometimes be taught with mathematics and science um, as a STEM subject. And there are a few schools in years seven and eight, and even nine and 10, where they're exploring that approach. Some schools are focusing around STEM fairs as their introduction to teaching digital technologies, where they run what used to be science fairs, but they now call them STEM fairs um, to include digital technologies. And students create solutions to problems. Might be a robot making its way through a maze um, and present those at a fair a science show um, and spend a few weeks learning about how to do those and use those technologies, creating some solutions to some problems and presenting those at a fair. Other schools are creating makerspaces, um, often in their libraries, which are becoming more and more underutilized, um, but they're spaces where the resources are provided to students to be able to go and work on their own projects and create their own solutions to problems. So pedagogy, this is how we go about teaching digital technologies. As mentioned before, direct instruction is still commonly used. We'll take students through learning how to do a loop in a programming language, and we'll show them on a whiteboard or on a projection screen, um, explain to them a few examples, do some Q&A with them, and take them through that process. But direct instruction can also happen through, um, in this case, video, but also computer-based instruction, where students work through activities. Um, and it's effective, particularly in uh, preparing students for fundamentals. But we also have project-based learning, where students undertake attempting to solve a problem. And some of these problems can be quite complex. We often take them from the um, UNESCO global goals. Um, how do we solve gender inequality? How do we solve poverty? How do we solve the problem of lack of fresh water or pandemics? And trying to come up with digital solutions that can help with those problems. And these can often involve use of various technologies such as robotics or internet of things, um, data logging, digital um, data capture, lots of different approaches to project-based learning that students can engage with. Creating websites, uh, creating apps. This is an example, uh, Taj Pabara. Um, he's a student um, halfway, between halfway from the Gold Coast and Brisbane. Um, in year 10, he started his own company, creating web pages for a BMW dealership. Uh, came quite successful at that, um, started employing other students and 
eventually other people, um, adults, to work on his company. His latest venture, uh, um, last year, he was in year 12, he was creating um, <sighs> computer kits where students could put together a laptop computer using pre-made components uh, to teach them about um, creating laptops. And at that stage, he'd, he had employees around the globe. Um, very entrepreneurial. So the key point there is that your students can do really fantastic things with digital technologies. In almost every case, the key entrepreneurs that we have, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Bill Gates, and so forth, they mention how during their schooling, they were inhibited by their teachers who didn't support them in exploring what they could do with technology and with entrepreneurship. So one of the key things we want to try to establish in Australian schools is the opportunities for entrepreneurship. And we're not good about that in Australia. In fact, we're really bad. In Australia, if you've gone bankrupt and you then go to a venture capitalist and say, I need more money to start a new um, business opportunity, you're rather unlikely to get it because they're going to look at you as a failure. In the United States, if you've gone bankrupt and you go and seek venture capital, they are much more likely to give it to you than if you've never gone bankrupt because they understand that you've probably learned quite a bit from that process of going bankrupt, from that process of failure, and that you're now much more likely to have learned from that than someone who's just coming in fresh. A very different mindset. And unfortunately, it carries through into our schooling system where through our assessment processes, we often inhibit students from taking risks. Um, so it's something we struggle with in project-based learning, how to give students the opportunity to take authentic risks without being penalized if they're not successful in those risks. And again, something we'll talk about during our tutorials. And I'd like you to think about some examples around that from your own perspectives and your own experiences and how we might be able to address that in our teaching. So entrepreneurship is quite an important thing though. More than likely, somewhere, somewhere, in a classroom right now is the next multi-billionaire that's going to be um, emerging. It's absolutely certain. They have to be somewhere, someone's classroom. Um, and are they going to be supported by their teachers or are they going to be inhibited? And we've got lots of competitions that often happen outside of schooling now that help support young entrepreneurship. And it's something we're trying to incorporate into the curriculum. It hasn't quite happened yet, but we are looking at ways of introducing entrepreneurship much more strongly. And again, that's something that will probably come in the next iteration of the digital technologies curriculum. But lots of good examples exist of students being entrepreneurial, coming up with apps and games and websites and various other approaches that could, could be commercialized. Another thing that we're going to talk about is um, the problem with females in computer education. We don't have a lot of students, a lot of girls studying computer education. It's one of the areas I do some research in um, and it's one of our problems. Now, we have gone through this before with science and mathematics and have been able to solve it in those cases. But computing is proving a little bit more problematic in identifying the reasons and solutions to having greater female participation in computing. Now, the reason this is important is think back to the very start when we talked about the future of jobs. If most of our jobs are going to be focused around digital technologies and an engagement with digital technologies, and girls are self-selecting out of those career paths, then that's going to have a significant impact upon our culture and our future society. So we want girls to be involved in those career paths and those opportunities. And if one of the impediments is around how digital technologies is being taught, then we need to understand that and come up with ways of addressing those. And there are various approaches being taken. Um, tech girls are superheroes, code, code like a girl, girls in tech Australia, just some of them. But 
unfortunately, they're not really solving the problem. This is a graph of um, girls in Australia engaging with um, external computer competitions. And we see up until year six, girls are more engaged than boys. Girls mature faster. They tend to be a little bit more academic at that age. Well, all the way through, actually. Um, but coming into high school, their engagement with computer computing and computer education drops off dramatically. And that's something that everyone is going to need to explore and address. And again, something we'll discuss more in the tutorials. So various approaches to teaching digital technologies. At one stage, we have um, activities and direct instruction. Teacher sets various things students to do, students do them. Or the computer sets things for them to do, students do them. The other extreme are projects, where students ideally, and this is again a progression, choose their own problems to solve and how they're going to solve them, the technologies they're going to use, and so forth. But that involves preparation. Students and teachers can't go straight into project-based learning. Um, they need to be supported and learn how to do project-based learning effectively. And again, something we're going to discuss during our course. But fundamentally, activity-based learning is around teacher choices. Project-based learning is around student choices. Doesn't have to be, but that's the norm. So activity-based learning has a range of focuses. Um, tends to work well with our scope and sequence. That's nicely broken into a series of different things that students need to do, the activities we can assign them to complete. It's very well structured and fits nicely into the structure of the Australian curriculum as it's been set out for what students need to learn. Um, fits nicely into our band descriptions. Every two years there's another set of things students need to learn and we can assign activities to support them in that learning. And works nicely with the content descriptors that you'll find in the Australian curriculum and the achievement standards that we have that can measure whether or not those um, outcomes have been achieved by students. So activity-based learning does really well at the fundamentals involved in um, digital technologies. Um, it fits well with teacher-directed pedagogy. We can have a series of directed activities, really good at achieving the lower order skills, um, teaching students how to remember various coding commands, how to use various commands, um, how to get a robot to do the fundamental elements of a, what a robot needs to do, um, how to put a, a website together, things of that nature. They can be self-paced and students can work on different activities, can be differentiated. But they tend to have a relatively limited, limited context. The teacher sets what the students need to do and essentially why. The context is the why. Why are we doing this? Okay, we're going to get a robot to save someone from the burning building. It's got to make its way through the maze, avoiding these objects, detecting the person, picking them up and taking them back out of the maze. The teacher provides that context for the student. Project-based learning, on the other hand, is much more focused around those higher order thinking skills, developing students' ability to be creative, um, their computational thinking, those aspects. It tends to align much more well with the rationale of the subject, why the subject exists, and the aims of the subject, which tends to be focused more on those higher order thinking approaches. It still has a reasonably good progression where students develop in capabilities of being able to do projects. And we'll see that in a second. Um, the curriculum does specify how students can develop in their ability to do project-based learning. And it also is much more easily incorporating the general capabilities, which sits outside of the specifics in the specified curriculum that can be added in as we have opportunities to develop them. It does take experience, both for teachers and for students. To be able to do project-based learning well, you can't just jump into a really, really complex, completely self-directed project. 
Um, students need to gain experience with doing projects throughout their schooling. And because it's embedded in the digital technologies curriculum, that should occur. It involves goal setting, where students set goals and aim to achieve those goals. Now, in more directed instruction, the teacher sets the goals. Having students set goals is a skill that they need to learn and develop. And for some students, it's difficult. It can involve entrepreneurship and develop entrepreneurial approaches. It almost always involves some level of teamwork and the development of those 21st century skills. And it has opportunities for students to iterate and fail, learn from those failures, redo the project and improve upon it. Now, I'd love to say that that always happens. It's the ideal. It very rarely happens because we often crowd the curriculum and we want to progress on to doing other things and we don't allow students opportunities to iterate. Um, but the best example of that is in drafting in English. We rarely accept a student's first draft for a written piece. We allow students to do that, receive corrections to fail and have opportunities to redo the task and to improve upon it. That's what should be happening also in the projects within digital technologies. Now, project-based learning is in the curriculum. This is highlighting the various um, points where project-based learning is, should be explicitly addressed. Um, so in the various earliest years, teachers support the students a lot with doing their projects because they're very young. But by year seven and eight, coming into high school, they should be managing their own projects, still with support from their peers and their teachers. But by nine and 10, students should be managing projects on their own. Well, that's quite different. Students should be at that stage able to manage projects on their own without teachers giving them direct instruction around how to complete the tasks. They should be identifying and using digital tools to support their project management, setting up timelines and shared folders and all those other um, aspects of a project. They should be able to coordinate their teams and collaborate with others. So working with others locally and globally, finding experts that can assist them and getting them to contribute to the achievement of their goals, solving their problems rather than just always doing it themselves. Again, something we don't do really well in Queensland or in Australian schools, um, or any school system for that matter. Actually allowing students to incorporate other expertise. Um, generally, we tend to see that as cheating, where students are utilizing, say, code from someone else, or going and finding code online, or hiring someone to write a piece of code for them so that they can incorporate that into their project. Now, how we incorporate those aspects into our teaching and learning of digital technologies is a challenge because it goes against the norms where we've previously expected students to do everything themselves. But there are ways of doing this. And increasingly now, we accept that students will utilize code libraries and pre-existing solutions to problems to support what they're doing with acknowledgement, but not having to do everything themselves. And then we come to the technologies. These are the tools that we're going to use and your students are going to use for learning about and creating solutions to problems. The first is of course coding and programming languages. Now in the earlier years, we use block-based coding where students combine various blocks that represent various instructions together to solve problems. That can progress to more wire frame type programming, where we connect up various connections between elements of the coding through to textual based coding. And in years nine and 10, we also delve into object orientated, only a little, but that's sort of framing where we want students to get through. We don't go hugely into object oriented programming, primarily because, well, at least in Queensland, in years 11 and 12, they don't do object oriented programming. So while it's in the curriculum for years seven, 
year, sorry, years nine and ten. Um, it's not for years eleven and twelve, so it's a little bit of a um, problem. But we certainly engage with coding and also with databases and the coding associated with databases, particularly around structured query languages. And the coding involved in querying a database and retrieving information. We also incorporate robotics and automation. And there are various robotic kits that are used at various levels that have increasing complexity around the solutions that can be achieved with robotic devices and automation devices. Um, and there are lots of microprocessor kits that are available that can be incorporated into the curriculum and allow students to code those devices to be able to automate various processes. Um, one popular one is uh, uh, running their own Minecraft servers. Um, they can't do that on the school computers and school network most often. Um, so setting it up on their own little microcomputer and having their computers log into that computer um, and have a shared server and gain experience with running a shared server. That's the key aspect involved in that process. And of course, there's data and information. Having students be able to access online data or other sources of data, entering their own data, um, being able to present that data in various ways, understanding the complexities and what can be achieved with large data sets. Um, one example was around the floods. Um, being able to use the Gold Coast uh, flood level database and doing what they've done in Brisbane and integrate that with mapping systems, uh, geographic information systems, to be able to provide an interactive um, display of the areas that will flood. Now, what's been done for Brisbane hasn't yet been done for the Gold Coast. Not a hard data, um, database task, but it just hasn't been effectively done yet. So there's a range of different solutions that are possible using data. And indeed, probably around about 90% of the solutions we see with digital technologies are focused around the use of data rather than coding or uh, robotic or automation devices. The other aspect of data is around data security and data vulnerabilities, how to keep our information secure, um, but also how the processes are involved with hacking and so forth. Um, and we call that white hat hacking and exploring what's done in that space to get access to data so that we can better protect environments from um, nefarious uses of technology. So remember, the main focus is on creating solutions. It's not about learning how to use the technologies for their own sake. It's about learning how to use the technologies so we can solve problems, so we can create solutions to problems. And there are lots of resources available that will support us in doing that. Uh, this is just a few that we're going to be using during the course. The Digital Technologies Hub will be a big one. Uh, this week in particular, we're going to be using the ACARA um, website, which will give us access to the curriculum and some of the resources that ACARA has put together to support the teaching of the curriculum. In Queensland, we've got the Queensland Coding Academy and the Curriculum into the Classroom, C2C uh, resources. Um, nationally, there's also the Australian Computing Academy that's been funded federally to support the teaching of digital technologies. Um, the Queensland Curriculum and Assessment Authority, which mostly looks after our senior subjects, but also has some involvement now with the um, uh, junior secondary subjects. And also the CSER, the uh, computer Science Education Research Group. So we'll be exploring all of those resources as we go through this course, particularly um, in your first assessment task, which again, we're going to discuss that in more detail during the tutorial. Of course, it's coming up quite soon, uh, due in week three. So you need to get um, your head around that very quickly and start preparing a submission around that. So that's it for this talk around the curriculum and some of the elements that we're going to be exploring further in this course, and of course, during our online tutorial. I'll see you then.